So I did have a question about the Revelation series, and probably I need to back up just a little bit and explain. Um, so I started this series in 1989 and got through most of the first chapter. And then I had a little hiatus for 30 plus years. That might be a world record for when you stop and restart something. But I got through most of the first chapter, um, maybe down to, I would say, around verse 18. But it was a verse-by-verse verse careful study. And rather than rehash that, you know, we're just going to kind of bring people up to date and then start afresh without covering everything that we said back in chapter 1. Because it's all on tape. It's all on um, YouTube. There's some interesting things said there, and I think I mentioned that last time. There's a little teaching on the background to the book and um, uh, what else? Some about um, idols and images because of this appearance of Jesus, but all that's back then. So last week, if you remember, we started over in 2 Peter chapter 3. And my point in starting there, and I'll just reference that again, is the fact that so many times people, I think, approach the book of Revelation just from the point of view of let's see if we can get all of our chronology and all of our dates right. And Peter's whole point is this should be our impetus for holy living, knowing that the second advent is, is just on the horizon. That's what he is stressing there. He said, you know, this is a great conflagration, you know, the burning of the atmosphere and of the earth. And he said, seeing that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of people should we be in all holy life and godliness? And in that chapter, Peter, as an apostle and as a prophet, he's looking into the future and he predicted and wrote about it. He said, there's going to be a certain group of people and he called them scoffers. He said they will arise in the last days. Scoffers, mockers, people they're going to make fun of. He knew what the topic was going to be. He said the topic, they're going to say the taunt that they had is where is the promise of his coming? We have heard you Christians talk about this for all these years. They'd heard about it all during the first century because Jesus said he was going to come again. The apostles and early church went around talking about the second advent and Peter anticipated. Peter knew he was living in the last days. The last days began with Pentecost. He knew we're living in the last days. In hindsight, if Peter was living in the last days, and he was 2,000 years ago, it's only logical that we also are in the last days, but we are that much further along. You know, logic would only tell us that. So Peter said they're going to be scoffers. He knew what they were going to be scoffing about. Where is the promise of his coming? And he even knew the basis of their argument. What they said was, well, nothing has ever changed in this world in relation to anything big or God. The world has continued from the beginning until now, just the way it always was. That was the basis for their argument. And Peter said, not true. He said, what you have conveniently forgotten, he said this they are willingly ignorant of. What you have conveniently forgotten is that there was a worldwide flood that changed the whole face of the planet. And so the comparison is with those people saying, nothing has changed. It's like God wound up the earth and just is going to let it run run until when, who knows, but he's just going to let it run, and he's not going to do anything about anything. That's what the scoffers said. The world has always run this way. It wasn't true. They had forgotten that. Peter's point is, as he goes on to say, God's going to enter into human history again, and that's what the book of Revelation is about. God is going to enter into human history again, and as he said before, after Noah's flood, I'll never destroy the world with a flood again. He didn't promise that he wouldn't destroy it again. And he actually is in a greater way than he did at Noah's flood. Look at these verses here again with me, if you don't mind, in 2 Peter 3, where he said in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 
the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy life and godliness? And then he goes on to, well, then he says in verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Which is where the book of Revelation is going to take us. So what do we have on our hands? I said last time with the book of Revelation, it almost depends on what church you were born into. And I hope you got my drift on that. And why is it if we're born into a certain theological framework that is necessarily right? I don't see people generally coming out of whatever theological framework they were born into. It's bred and dead. If you're a Baptist, you're a Baptist. If you're an Episcopalian, you're an Episcopalian. And I said last week, how is it everybody could be so lucky to be born into the system that's right? You know, I think what we all have to do is we have to compare everything to Scripture. Easier said than done. Not the popular thing to do. It takes more effort and work. But it's the only way to really arrive at the truth. So what do we have on our hands with this book of Revelation? We definitely have something that is, is most holy. It is a prophetic book. We saw in chapter 1 and verse 1 this business of being sent from God the Father through intermediaries to us. And to me, the verse is just amazing that God the Father gave the revelation to God the Son who sent an angel to give it to the Apostle John to write a letter to the seven churches and we, we, 2,000 years later, we are the recipients. We are the beneficiaries of that. Chapter 1, verse 1, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to, which is an interesting statement in itself. Uh, you mean the son didn't know? You mean the son didn't have it? Interesting, but probably for another study in theology, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And we looked at that word shortly doesn't necessarily mean tomorrow. It just means we looked at the um, parable of the unjust judge. It means speedily that when it does begin to happen, it will happen quickly. But it also, if you'll hold your finger there, and if you can find the little minor prophet Habakkuk, uh, there's an interesting verse over here in Habakkuk that I would draw your attention to. Um, it's in the second chapter and verse 3. You know, verse 4 was a famous verse of the Reformation that Martin Luther based his exit from the Roman Catholic Church on, the just shall live by faith. But notice what's going on here in this verse. Um, read it for yourself there. It, you know, this is a vision that God has given Habakkuk. And he talks about, well, though it tarry, it's surely going to come. Um, but it won't tarry, but it will tarry, but it won't tarry. What is he saying there? I think when the prophets received these revelations from God, it was so absolutely real and incredible to them. You know, it was though they could reach out and touch that. It, there is a sense in which it will tarry. There is a sense in which it will not tarry. You know, God lives outside time. And the prophets in the prophetic consciousness that they experienced, to them, as though, it was as though they could reach out and touch it. And I think that's sometimes what the apostles are feeling in the New Testament. The second advent, you know, might seem to be a long way off. Even based on some of the parables, Jesus gave the parable of a certain nobleman that would go into a far country to receive a kingdom. He would be gone a long time before he came back. 
Mm, that would give some indication that the second advent may not happen in the lives of the early apostles. But yet they were always constantly talking about it and talking as though it might happen. When Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, then we which we, we which are alive and remain into the coming of the Lord will not precede those that have died. They'll be raised, we'll all be caught up together. And Paul expected himself in one sense or the other, you know, to possibly still be alive. Um, so it's interesting in Habakkuk that the vision might tarry, although he said, no, it won't tarry. It's surely going to be upon us. And Habakkuk prophesying hundreds of years before some of these events are going to come to pass. So back to Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. A revelation given from the Father through the Son to an angel, to John, to the seven churches, to us. And that word, by the way, revelation, is in the Greek, apocalypse. And that's where we get our, you know, you sometimes hear the book of Revelation. Uh, you sometimes hear it being called the apocalypse. Um, and that's because that's exactly what it is. It is a revelation. You hear of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. All that means it's the four horsemen that are found somewhere in this book, which is over in, in chapter 6. I shared with you last time a method that I have found beneficial as you read Revelation or any part of the Scripture, um, and that is to try to put yourself into the mindset of the person. Uh, I think sometimes we get caught up in simply trying to make sure that we read the book read the Bible, read the Old Testament, read the New Testament, and that's all really important and necessary because it familiarizes you overall with the names and with the characters and with the dates and the events. Um, you can narrow that down to studying a book from the same point of view, but then you can do something different, which is what we tried to work our way through some last time. This is a book of visions. This is a book of visions and voices from beyond the veil. These are things John saw and he heard, and then he was commanded what you see and what you hear right in the book. And that's what I want people to do as they read this. Forget for a moment trying to understand what does the end of this verse really say. You'll get to that. We'll get to that. You'll work that out. But try to read it and absorb it. What if you're on the island of Patmos? What if you were under, you know, religious oppression and you're in a cave or you're on a barren atoll somewhere and you have these things happen to you? These visions, it's a book of sights and sounds and color and movement. And we looked at some of those, some of them we didn't look at. Hopefully you've had a chance to read the book and see some of these. One of the ones we didn't talk about, John said he saw a great sign in heaven and he looked, and it was a woman paying to be delivered. She was so far along in, in carrying a child. And he saw she had a crown on her head and 12 stars. And she had wrapped around herself a cloak, and it was the sun. And she was standing on the moon. Now, John lets us know that's not an actual woman. He said, I saw a great sign in heaven and a sign always points us to something. He saw a woman. The woman was a sign and she's full of symbolism. She's great with child, pain to be delivered. She's clothed with the sun. She's standing on the moon. She has a crown. She has 12 stars on the crown. And as we read a little bit, she delivers this child, but it's not just a child. It's a man child. It's a male. And he was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Book of Revelation, chapter 12. And we go a little further and we see this same woman. And now she has two wings like a great eagle. And she flew into the wilderness where there was a place prepared for her where they should nourish her for a thousand years. 260 days. What are we talking about now? Book of Revelation. Before he saw that woman, when he saw the horses come out in chapter 6, he saw a white horse, he saw, he saw a red horse, he saw a black horse, and then he saw a really pale and yellowish, greenish horse. Verse 2 had a weapon with them. 
The third one doesn't have a weapon. First one had a bow, second one had a sword. The third one has a pair of balances in his hand. What does that mean? John is seeing this. These all, all of these things have great significance. And he, there he not only sees, but he hears. He said he heard a voice from the throne say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And as he kept watching, then the next seal got broken. The last living creature uttered his voice. And then he sees a horse come out and that rider is death. And right behind him is hell. <laughs> John sees all of this. Don't let these things escape you as you're trying to figure out, well, what does it mean? First of all, absorb what it is that you're actually seeing. And it will have an effect on you. We've talked about some of the other things he saw. We didn't talk about the new Jerusalem that he saw coming down as a bride adorned for her husband from heaven. He sees 12 gates. They are each their own several individual pearl. He sees the foundations. He's, he takes the measurements of the city. It's 1,500 miles in this direction and 1,500 miles in that direction and 1,500 miles in that direction. And he's just astonished. Remember how we said last time that he lost his way in the book on so many occasions. And I don't know that the casual reader detects that. He lost his way. He cries uncontrollably. He forgets to ask the right question. He bows and worships the wrong person. And you can't blame him because of how overwhelming this is. One of the things he heard late in the book that I love so dearly, he said, Be he heard a voice, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And He will be with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall take away all sorrow, pain, sickness, and death. And then he said he heard another voice from the throne that said, I will make all things new. What does that mean? I will make all things new. He just listed some of them for us. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. You know, the things that we humans struggle with, death and sorrow and crying and pain, those are some of the former things. He said the former things are passed away. The former, all of the former things are passed away. And behold, I will make all things new. Oh my. Um, just, um, just an incredible series of visions and voices that John has here. Well, let's come back to chapter 1. Um, we are, as I said last week, we're in the year... A.D. 95, we're at the close of the first century of the Christian era. It's an end of the apostolic age. We're 2,000 years removed from that. As far as we know, the Apostle John, who was the younger brother of the James and John duo, is the last surviving member of the original apostolate. The apostolate, the group that we call the 12 apostles, oh, minus one, and then he was added back in with Matthias. John is 60 plus years past the day of Pentecost, past the ascension of Christ. He's got so much he can look back on and remember as he and his brother James were chosen to be a disciple, to be an apostle. They left their fishing nets. They left their father. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Peter and his brother Andrew, they were all in business together on the Sea of Galilee When Jesus appointed them, he gave them power to cast out unclean spirits, power to heal every type of disease. He sent them out and said, go and heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse the leper and cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. 
And they did that and they experienced all of this. But as they got to the end of Jesus' earthly life, things began to change and things began to get really difficult. Follow me on this as we're going to tie this in to Revelation 1, 9 and 10. You know, Jesus had made a lot of trips to Jerusalem, or he had made several trips, and the gospel writers are all in one accord in discussing the last trip that Jesus made. They even talk about he set his face to go to Jerusalem and made the ascent to the city. And the apostles did not know the significance of this last trip to Jerusalem. Um, Jesus knew. And Jesus told them in the garden, I'm going to be betrayed and bad things are getting ready to happen. And of course, Peter said, I will not, I'll stay here with you the whole time. I will not forsake you. You can count on me. I'm even willing to die for you. And the other apostles agreed and said, we are too. And Jesus said, wait here and I'm going to go pray. He went and he prayed. And we know when he got back, they were all asleep. He came back the second time and they were asleep. And they said, we will die for you. And they couldn't even stay awake for him. They had been so fearful. And of course, as soon as he was arrested, they all forsook him and fled. They had been so fearful post-Pentecost. They are so fearless. After Pentecost, these same men who had run and hidden in the upper room they were behind closed door for fear of the Jews, could not preach enough, could not preach often enough. And this is, this is John who saw what Jesus went through, who's gone through his whole entire life. We're towards the end of the first century. And whenever John passes into the shadows, two very important things are going to happen. He's the last, as far as we know, of the surviving members of the original apostles. When he passes into the shadows, two important things are going to happen. Number one, we have an end of the apostolic eyewitness of Christ's bodily resurrection, which was the heart of the gospel. Jesus had predicted his own death. Jesus was not a normal, typical first century martyr who died for a cause. Jesus had predicted his own death. He told the disciples that they he will go to Jerusalem. I'll be betrayed into the hands of sinners. I will be crucified. But Jesus did more than that. He also predicted how long he would stay dead. Other people might have died a martyr. Other people might have even said, I'll probably die a martyr. And nobody had predicted their own resurrection and nobody had said, on the third day I will rise. And not only did Jesus predict his death and resurrection, he said, I will raise myself, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. When he was before Pontius Pilate, Pilate was trying to get answers out of him as to why? What is the ruckus the Jewish leaders have with you? And Jesus didn't answer anything. And Pilate said, don't you know that I have power over you? I have power to crucify you and power to release you. And Jesus finally spoke up and he said, you could have no power over me at all unless it were given you from above. Remember when he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down in John 10 and I will take it up again. You know, I can stand here. I think we all, if Jesus doesn't return during my lifetime, I, I can predict my own death. And I can predict my own resurrection because I have that assurance in Scripture. I will be raised from the dead, but I can't tell you when, and I definitely can't raise myself. That witness to Jesus' bodily, physical resurrection, it was critical that the apostles had seen that. Whenever they go to the tomb, the whole business of the empty tomb and then the post-tomb, post-resurrection experiences is for them to have actually seen him with their own eyes. And they did. And if you look over in uh, the book of Acts chapter 2, you read part of Peter's sermon. 
Peter in Acts 2 and verse 32 says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. When they chose Matthias as the replacement for Judas Iscariot in Acts chapter 1, verses 21, 22, the end of verse 22, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. They went everywhere pre preaching the resurrection. Peter's early sermons in the book of Acts are dominated with the theme of Jesus' resurrection. And in order to short circuit the cults and the liberal views, you almost have to use all the words. It was physical. It was bodily. It was visible. It was tangible. People saw it. Um, if you don't watch out, the cults and the liberals come in with their views on um, history versus history. You know, history, H-I-S-T-O-R-Y, is history. Like um, George Washington went across the Delaware River. You know, we have history, history, H-I-S-T-O-R-I-E. Well, what the liberals say is it's a different kind of history. It's not a history that you'd put in a textbook. It's not factual. It's not observable. It wasn't bodily or visible. But if his resurrection means something to you, if the thought of him having raised means something to you, then it, that's good. Then it happened for you. Now, did it happen back in ancient history? Of course not. You know, was Jonah in a fish's belly for three days? Of course not. Did Jonah go and preach to Nineveh and that city repented? Of course not. Was the earth created in six literal consecutive 24-hour days? Of course not. But if it means something to you, that's the German higher criticism. That's history versus history. So the first thing that happens is that we have the end of the apostolic eyewitness account of Christ's bodily resurrection. And then we have something that's just as important. With John passing into the shadows, we have the, and the, and the ink drying on the last page of the book of Revelation, we have the end of recorded Christian history. Much like the Jews had experienced 500 years earlier, if you can hold your finger at the end of the Old Testament and the end of the New you know, prior to Malachi, the last of the literary prophets in the Old Testament, God had faithfully spoken to His people for a thousand years. You know, since Moses the prophet, Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Since Moses the prophet, God had faithfully spoken to His people. Jeremiah uses an interesting phrase often in his book where where he says, speaking from God's point of view, that God rose early and sent my servants the prophets. It's a beautiful metaphor, as though God were up before anybody else, sending the prophets, making sure they had adequate preparation and, and warning of the blessings of obedience and the curses of disobedience. And Jeremiah says it on many occasions that God rose early and sent his servants the prophets. And we have all of this in what we call the Old Testament. We have all of this recorded history. And when we get down to Malachi around 433 B.C., we're getting ready to see the end of recorded biblical Old Testament Jewish, forgetting the New Testament for a moment, Jewish history. We're getting ready to see the end of that. And let's look at how it ends. And these verses will become very important to us later on. Behold, Malachi 4, 5 and 6, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, look at what I'm about to say. This is important. This is amazing. Watch, look, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Behold, I, God is speaking. We know who the subject is. You know, if you're an English major and you break sentences down and you can figure out who's the subject, who's the direct object, who's the indirect object, you're, you've got to step on everybody else. But even if you haven't been an English major, verses like this involve no symbolism. We have no dragons. We have no women great with child. Uh, we have no different colored horses. We have no trumpet sounding. 
we have some straightforward word to us. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is that favorite Old Testament catchphrase among the prophets to speak of the last days, the same time that the book of Revelation is addressing. And we have it all in order. Behold, I, God, will send you, the nation of Israel, I'll send you who or what. We don't even have to guess. You know, there's enough difficult things in the Bible. Let's don't ever make difficult what's straightforward. Let's leave the difficult difficult and the straightforward straightforward. The difficult, we have to work a little trying to interpret. The straightforward, behold, I will send you, Elijah, the prophet, and I'm going to tell you when I'm going to send him. It's going to be before something, and I'm going to tell you what it's before. <laughs> It's before the day of the Lord. And I'm going to describe what the day of the Lord is like. It is dreadful and great. People have this misconception that the day of the Lord is a happy time. Wake up, the Old Testament prophets would say. And then he tells us why he's going to send him. Who is sent, when he's sent, why he's sent. The circumstances around when he is being sent. And he will turn the heart of the fathers to the children. And the heart of the children to their fathers. Uh, lest I come and smite the earth here. It's a great, that's an R. H -E Herem. H-E-R-E-M. It's a great Old Testament word, especially seen back in Joshua's day whenever they came in and were conquering the, by um, God's power, conquering the tribes that were still in the Palestine area. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So we read backwards. Uh, Elijah doesn't come. The hearts of the fathers are not turned to the children, the hearts of the children not turned to their fathers, the earth smitten with a curse. That's the close of the biblical revelation, Old Testament, to the nation of Israel. Now, let's turn to the end of the New Testament. The last two verses of Revelation Chapter 22, Revelation 22, in verse 20, He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. John says, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We've got the prediction of the coming of Elijah at the end of the Old Testament. We have Jesus' own words of assurance at the conclusion of the New Testament. Surely I come quickly. You know, I'm just going to let that stand for what it says. If he says, surely I come quickly, and the word can be translated speedily, why tamper with it? Just leave it there. Reminding ourselves of what we saw in 2 Peter 3 of the scoffers will say, well, in the last days, where's the promise of His coming? Here's a promise of His coming right here. Where is the promise of His coming? Here it is right here. Surely I come quickly. And John says, even so, come Lord Jesus. I was talking to my son, Jonathan, the other night because I had just meditated on these verses again. And that last verse, I said, you know, this was said by the Apostle John. And the Apostle John was the disciple the Lord loved and leaned on his breast and was close to him. And whatever the Apostle John prays is going to be answered. As far as I'm concerned, it's going to be answered. It's going to be answered for me. Verse 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I'm for sure going to reach out by faith and receive that. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. That's the Apostle John talking not only to the seven churches in Asia, but talking to us all these years later who are believing this same word. So I want to focus now on the ninth and tenth verse, especially the ninth verse of chapter one. And there won't be a lot of other things I'll have to say about this chapter. The circumstances under which John wrote this are, are, are different than what he had experienced before. I've given you a date, I don't know if it was on or off the record last time, of around A.D. 95 for John writing Revelation. Prior to this, John was free. He wasn't a religious or political captive. John was free to roam about. Uh, his last two epistles, look at Second John and Third John. They're only one chapter, so I just give you the verses. Second John, verse 12. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Just prior to Revelation, John was still free to move about. And when he wrote 3 John in verses 13 and 14, I had many things to write, uh, but I will not with ink and pen. And he says basically the same thing, that I trust I shall sh shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. So something has happened between John's epistles and John's apocalypse. We have a new emperor in Rome. And when the emperors came to leadership in Rome, it was not much different than a political leader like a president in our country. And what I mean by that is we've had presidents who were Southern Baptists. We have presidents who were Catholics. We've had presidents who were Christians and who were non-Christians. Just because you're a political leader, I mean, all political leaders, they, they differ in their approach to religion. Some of the Roman emperors were just secularists. I mean, it was a, it was a um, governmental duty for them. They, had, they neither believed in God nor didn't believe. It was of no concern. Some of them worshiped the gods of the Romans. And some of them went even further. The emperor that came to the throne in Rome in the early 90s AD, Domitian, uh, was involved in what became known as the cult of emperor worship. He didn't worship anything. He wanted people to worship him. And Christian believers were proving to be pests throughout the Roman Empire. You know, you could get the Christians. They were not criminals. They did not do things illegal. But there was a certain line they wouldn't cross. Paul had taught th for the Christians to obey the government. And the powers that be are ordained of God. And if you resist the power, you're resisting God. But when it came to worshiping the emperor, oh, no, no, no. The Roman Empire could not get them to conform. And as a result, we have what's going on here in Revelation 1 and verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. He was not here for church planning opportunities. This was not an evangelistic outreach for the Apostle John. He ended up here because of emperor worship, probably, and because he was a pest. He tells us the two things that put him here, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, because he believed and preached the word and because he believed on and shared Jesus with people, this was not going well with the Roman authorities around him. Uh, John calls himself, if you will note in the beginning of this verse, he calls himself your, our brother. This great apostle has humbled himself 
to call himself, I'm your brother. He's our brother. And he also says, and I'm your companion in tribulation. What's the book of Revelation going to be about? Chapters 4 to 19. The tribulation. It's not without significance that John is writing this from a place of imprisonment, not writing it from a place of freedom as Paul had done his epistles, as John had done his gospel and his epistles. It should not go unnoticed that John has gone through tribulation. He is under island arrest. And the theme of the book of Revelation is going to be about tribulation. And one of the big figures in the book of Revelation is the emperor of all emperors who absolutely demands worship. You know to whom I refer in chapter 13, the Antichrist, the emperor of all emperors who demands worship and who is going to be successful in obtaining that worship. From whom? From most of the world. From Christians? Absolutely not. But do you know what? That's going to be the proving point. That is going to be the proving point. Now, if Revelation, written by John from a a place of difficulty, from a place of persecution, from a place of persecution because he was not involved and would not support emperor worship, if that's the backdrop, and that is, that's the backdrop to him writing Revelation, the book, that forms the backdrop to the entire book. According to Eusebius, he was released not long after this. So he is only here for a limited period of time. And it was while he was on the island of Patmos, while he was locked up for all practical purposes, he couldn't go out and do anything. He's under island arrest. If it was while he was here that this book is given, what is that telling us? about the content of the, of the book, the nature of the book. What is that telling us? And I'll be more specific later in this series. I'm just saying this is the background, the backdrop to the book. If John is going through tribulation and he is writing in verse 9, I'm your companion in the tribulation you're going through. Where is it that we get this notion that Christians aren't going to go through any type of tribulation? or that Christians aren't going to go through the tribulation. Where do we get this notion? Who are all these people that are being persecuted in the book of Revelation? Who are all these people being martyred? Who are all these people that die? Who are all these people that don't take the mark? Who are the people resurrected in the end in chapter 20 and verse 4? Those who were beheaded for Christ. And he said, I saw them sit on thrones and they reigned for a thousand years with Christ. Where did those people come from? Who are the souls under the altar? What about the people in chapter 13? I'll give you the verse if I can find it quickly. In verse 7, this is the emperor of all emperors. This is the beast that came up out of the sea. This is uh, the Antichrist. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. It was given unto him to make war and to win. He's not losing. Not in chapter 13 he's not. And to overcome them. And power is given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth will worship him. uh, Except uh, those names who are not written in the book of the uh, life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. I think when people delve into Revelation, they're probably going into it. Well, they're definitely going into it with preconceived ideas about the tribulation and about the rapture. And they probably don't take into consideration the context in which the book is set in chapter one. They probably don't take into consideration the fact that John is not free. I know he ends up being free later, but John is not free. And the people to whom he is writing or experiencing great tribulation at the end of the first century. So 
I think the fact that there was emperor worship going on and John was experiencing some of the ramifications of that, and we see the great emperor of all emperors in chapter 13, the Antichrist, the beast who is rising up out of the sea, that the emperors of Rome were simply but types of the final emperor that would make his appearance on the scene of history. And I would, I would urge all people to, before they finalize their views on the rapture and the timing of the rapture, I would urge them all to carefully consider what Revelation is really going to say. I find it interesting and I know I'm ahead of the story and some of you know of what I speak and maybe some of you don't, but I, I find it interesting that people who hold to a certain theory of the timing of the rapture then really struggle when they find all of these dead Christians in the book of Revelation or people dying as Christians then they have to start coming up with new theories for explaining how all these people are there. And of course, if they have that certain theory of the timing of the rapture that we will talk about in a lot of detail later on, then we end up on, let's say, day two after the rapture of there being zero Christians in the world. Zero, none, zilch, nada, not a one. According to that theory, according to that theory, all the Christians have been raptured. There's no Christians around. And how does anyone ever become a Christian after that point of view? I mean, after that point in time. Well, um, we have some very uh, interesting things to look at in the future. Um, hey, folks, I'm sorry. My next topic is huge, so I can't go any further. I'm going to stop right there minister a song that's called it will only last if it's eternal Why do we spend so long?